Madame de Pompadour, the mistress of King Louis XV. Madame de Pompadour, born Jean Antoinette Poisson, was a prominent figure in 18th century France. She was the official chief mistress of King Louis XV from 1745 until her death in 1764. She wielded considerable influence at the French court, not just as a lover, but also as an advisor, patron of the arts, and a supporter of Enlightenment philosophers and artists. Madame de Pompadour was known for her intelligence, wit, and sophistication, playing a significant role in the cultural and political life of France during her time. Jean Antoinette Poisson was born on December 29, 1721, in Paris, to Francois Poisson and his wife, Madeleine de la Motte. It is suspected that her biological father was either the rich financier Jean Paris de Montmartel or the tax collector Charles Francois Paul Lenormand de Turnham. Lenormand de Turnham became her legal guardian when Francois Poisson was forced to leave the country in 1725 after a scandal over a series of unpaid debts. Such crime at that time was punishable by death, however, he was cleared eight years later and allowed to return to France. At age five, Jean Antoinette was sent to receive the finest quality education of the day in an Ursuline convent in Poissy, where she gained admiration for her wit and charm. Due to poor health, thought to be whooping cough, Jean Antoinette returned home in January 1730 at age nine. During this time, her mother took her to a fortune teller, Madame de Leban, who predicted that the girl would one day reign over the heart of a king. Henceforth she became known as Rionette, meaning little queen, and was groomed to become the mistress of Louis XV. Turnham arranged for Jean Antoinette to receive a private education at home with the best teachers at the time. From there on she was taught dancing, drawing, painting, engraving, theater, the arts, and the ability to memorize entire plays. It may have been this sponsoring of Jean Antoinette's education, in particular, that sparked rumors of his paternity to Poisson. At the age of 19, Jean Antoinette was married to Charles Guillaume Le Normand d'Ideals, the nephew of her guardian Charles Le Normand de Turnham, who initiated the match and the large financial incentives that came with it. On December 15, 1740, Turnham made his nephew his sole heir, disinheriting all his other nephews and nieces, the children of his brother and sister. These included the estate at Edial's, a wedding gift from her guardian, which was situated on the edge of the royal hunting ground of the Forest of Sinart. Once married, Lenormand de Edial's fell passionately in love with his wife, while she addressed that she would never leave him, except for the king. The couple had a son who died in infancy and a daughter, Alexandre and Lenormand de Edials, born in 1744, who died at the age of nine. As a married woman, Jean Antoinette could frequent celebrated salons in Paris, such as those hosted by Madame de Tencin, Geoffrin, Du de Fa, and others. Within these salons she crossed paths with principal figures of the Enlightenment, including Voltaire, Charles Pino Duclos, Montesquieu, Hildedius, and Bernard de Fontenelle. Additionally, Jean Antoinette created her own salon at Edial's, which was attended by many of the cultural elite, among them were Crebelin Phils, Montesquieu, the Cardinal de Bernis, and Voltaire. Within these circles she learned the fine art of conversation and developed the sharp wit for which she would later become known at Versailles. Due to her involvement in Paris salons as well as her grace and beauty, Louis XV had heard the name of Jean Antoinette mentioned at court as early as 1742.In 1744, Jean Antoinette sought to catch the eye of the king while he led the hunt in the forest of Sinart. Because she occupied an estate near this location, she was permitted to follow the royal party at a distance. However, wanting to attract the king's notice, Jean Antoinette drove directly in front of the king's path, once in a pink phaeton, wearing a blue dress, and once in a blue phaeton, wearing a pink dress. The king sent a gift of venison to her. Though the king's current mistress Maria and de Maley, named Madame de Chateauroux, had warned off Jean Antoinette, the position became vacant on December 8, 1744, when Chateauroux died. On February 24, 1745, Jean Antoinette received a formal invitation to attend the masked ball held on February 25 at the Palace of Versailles to celebrate the marriage of the Dauphin Louis of France to Infanta Maria Theresa of Spain. It was at this ball that the king, 
disguised along with seven courtiers as a yew tree, publicly declared his affection for Jean Antoinette. Before all of court and the royal family, Louis unmasked himself before Jean Antoinette, who was dressed as Diana the Huntress in reference to their encounter in the forest of Sennart. By March, she was the king's mistress, installed at Versailles in an apartment directly above his dot on May 7, the official separation between her and her husband was pronounced. To be presented at court, she required a title. The king purchased the Marquis de Pompadour on June 24 and gave the estate, with title and coat of arms, to Jean Antoinette, making her a Marquise. On September 14, 1745, Madame de Pompadour made her formal entry before the king, presented by the king's cousin, the Princess of Conti. Determined to make her place at court secure, Jean Antoinette immediately attempted to forge a good relationship with the royal family. After the queen engaged Pompadour in a conversation by inquiring after a mutual acquaintance, Madame de Sysac, Pompadour responded in delight, swearing her respect and loyalty to Marie Leskczynska. The queen in return favored Jean Antoinette instead of the king's other mistresses. Pompadour quickly mastered the highly mannered court etiquette. However, her mother died on Christmas Day of the same year, and did not live to see her daughter's achievement of becoming the undisputed royal mistress. Through her position as court favorite, Pompadour wielded considerable power and influence, she was elevated on October 12, 1752 to Duchess and in 1756 to Lady-in-Waiting to the Queen, the most noble rank possible for a woman at court. Pompadour effectively played the role of Prime Minister, becoming responsible for appointing advancements, favors and dismissals, and contributing in domestic and foreign politics. In 1755, she was approached by Wenzel Anton, Prince of Kaunitz Ryatberg, a prominent Austrian diplomat, asking her to intervene in the negotiations which led to the Treaty of Versailles. This was the beginning of the diplomatic revolution, which saw France allied to their former enemy Austria. Under these changed alliances, the European powers entered the Seven Years' War, which saw France, Austria, and Russia pitted against Britain and Prussia. France suffered a defeat at the hands of the Prussians in the Battle of Rossbach in 1757, and eventually lost the American colonies to the British. After Rossbach, Madame de Pompadour is alleged to have comforted the king with the now famous, arrest, après nous, le déluge. France emerged from the war diminished and virtually bankrupt. Madame de Pompadour persisted in her support of these policies, and when Cardinal de Bernis failed her, she brought Choiseul into office and supported and guided him in all his plans, the Pacte de Famille, the suppression of the Jesuits and the Treaty of Paris, 1763. Britain's victories in the war had allowed it to surpass France as the leading colonial power, something which was commonly blamed on Pompadour. Pompadour protected the physiocrate school, its leader was Canet, her own doctor, which paved the way for Adam Smith's theories. She also defended the encyclopedia edited by Denis Diderot and Jean Laurent d'Alembert against those, among them the Archbishop of Paris Christophe de Beaumont, who sought to have it suppressed. In Diderot's first novel, Les Bijoux Indiscrets, the indiscreet jewels, the characters of Mango Ghoul and Merzoza are allegories of Louis XV and Pompadour, respectively. Diderot portrayed Pompadour in a flattering light, most likely to ensure her support for Encyclopédie. Pompadour had a copy of Les Bijoux Indiscrets in her library, which may explain why the crown did not pursue Diderot for such an indiscretion against the king. The Marquise had many enemies among the royal courtiers who felt it a disgrace that the king would thus compromise himself with a commoner. She was very sensitive to the unending libels, called Poissonades, analogous to Mazarinade against Cardinal Mazarin and a pun on her family name, Poisson, which means fish in French. Only with great reluctance did Louis take punitive action against her known enemies, such as Louis-François Armand du Plessis, Duc de Richelieu. Madame de Pompadour was able to wield such influence at court due to the invaluable role she played as a friend and confidant of the king. In opposition to previous mistresses of Louis XV, Pompadour made herself invaluable to the king by becoming the only person whom Louis trusted and who could be counted on to tell him the truth. Pompadour was an indispensable comfort to Louis who was prone to melancholy and boredom. 
She alone was able to captivate and amuse him and would entertain Louis with elegant private parties and operas sometimes even with his wife, Queen Marie Leszczynska, in attendance since she would also invite her, with the help of the king, afternoons of hunting and journeying among their various real estate holdings. Around 1750 Madame de Pompadour's role as friend of the king became her solitary role as she ceased her sexual relationship with the king. The end of this sexual relationship was in part attributed to Pompadour's poor health, as she suffered the aftereffects of whooping cough, recurring colds and bronchitis, spitting blood, headaches, three miscarriages to the king, as well as an unconfirmed case of leucorrhea. In addition, Pompadour admitted to having the misfortune to be of a very cold temperament and attempts to increase her libido with a diet of truffles, celery, and vanilla were unsuccessful. Furthermore, in 1750 the jubilee year placed pressure upon the king to repent of his sins and renounce his mistress. In order to cement her continuing importance as favorite in the face of these impediments, Pompadour took on the role of friend of the king which she announced through artistic patronage. Pompadour's announcement was most prominently declared through her commission from Jean-Baptiste Pigal, of a sculpture representing herself as amity, friendship, offering herself to a now lost pendant sculpture of Louis XV. Pompadour also had a related sculpture depicted in a portrait of herself painted by Francois Boucher in 1759. Built in the second half of the 17th century, the Château de Saint-Duin has belonged to the prestigious Dukes of Jespers until its destruction in 1821, to build the actual Château for the Comtesse du Cala. After the sale of her Château de Cressy, unexpectedly, the Marquise de Pompadour did not purchase Saint-Duin but benefited from the usufruct of this residence from 1759 until her death in 1764. The plan of the chateau, originally designed by Antoine Le Potter, was a classical U-shape and consisted of a long façade with two wings prolonging the main body, facing the river Seine on the garden side. saint Tuan's originality resided in its interior distribution, the main body consisted of a succession of three salons à l'Italienne, whose decoration was entirely modified by the Slots family in the 1750s for the Jespers family. In French architecture, a salon à l'Italienne is a room filling all the height of a building, a memorable example is the Grand Salon at vaux le vicomte In addition to this layout, as soon as Madame de Pompadour acquired the estate, a vast project of reorganization of the entire buildings, including stables and dependences, was planned, costing more than 500.000 livres. In the absence of the original plans, a restitution of the ground floor has been proposed. It seems that the architect who supervised this reorganization was Anne-Jacques Gabriel, who, at that time, directed all the renovation and building works of the different residences of Madame de Pompadour. Using the central Salon à l'Italienne as a pivot, an apartment was created for the king as a counterpart to that of the henceforth Duchesse de Pompadour, making the prestigious Château de Saint-Duin into a reflection of her own status a symbol of her social and political achievements, despite misconceptions perpetuated by her contemporaries and much of historical discourse, Pompadour did not supplement her role as mistress by employing replacement lovers for the king. Following the cessation of Pompadour's sexual relationship with Louis, the king met with young women in a house in Versailles established particularly for that purpose, called the Parc Aux Cerfs, or Stag Park. It was not, as often described, a harem, it was occupied by only one woman at a time. Pompadour was not involved, other than to accept it as a necessity. Pompadour's only contribution to the stag park was to accept it as a favorable alternative to a rival at court, as she stated, it is his heart I want. All these little girls with no education will not take it from me, I would not be so calm if I saw some pretty woman of the court or the capital trying to conquer it. Madame de Pompadour was an influential patron of the arts who played a central role in making Paris the perceived capital of taste and culture in Europe. She attained this influence through the appointment of her guardian Charles-Francois Paul Le Normand de Turnham, and later her brother, Abel Poisson in the post of Director General de Bédiments, which controlled government policy and expenditures for the arts. She championed French pride by constructing and later outright buying a porcelain factory at Sèvres in 1759, which became one of the most famous porcelain manufacturers in Europe, 
and which provided skilled jobs for the region. Numerous sculptors and portrait painters were patronized by Pompadour, among them the court artist Jean-Marc Nadier. In the 1750s François Boucher, Jean-Baptiste Revalin and François-Hubert Drouet's she patronized Jacques Gay, the gemstone engraver, who taught her to engrave an onyx, jasper and other semi-precious stones. Pompadour greatly influenced and stimulated innovation in what is known as the Rococo style in the fine and decorative arts, for example, through her patronage of the artists like Boucher and the constant refurnishing of the 15 residences she held with Louis. Like Pompadour, this style was critiqued by some as a pernicious feminine influence. Despite the fact that it was embraced by many men as well as women, however, it is also widely recognized that Madame de Pompadour engaged with prominent artists as a way to capture the attention of the king whilst cultivating her public image. The oil sketch of Pompadour's lost portrait by Boucher sits in the Starhemberg Room at Waddesdon Manor, built by Baron Ferdinand de Rothschild, surrounded by Sevres porcelain another industry that she greatly influenced and innovated through personal dissemination across an international network of her own clientele. In addition to supporting the arts as a patron, Pompadour also participated in them more directly. Besides being one of the few 18th-century practitioners of gem engraving, she was an acclaimed stage actress in plays staged at her private theaters at Versailles and Bellevue. Some of the artworks made under Pompadour's purview by other hands, notably the 1758 portrait by Boucher of Madame de Pompadour at her toilette, can be viewed as collaborations with Pompadour. Madame de Pompadour is considered an amateur printmaker who made print engravings with the help of Boucher. She had engraving equipment to create the prints of works by Boucher and Gay, brought within her personal apartments in Versailles. Her political mind also can be attributed to her great book collection. She collected influential books such as The History of the Stuarts, printed in 1760 with her own printing press, which can be determined through the stamp markings of her arms located on the cover. Baron Ferdinand de Rothschild, an avid 19th-century collector in London and Waddesdon Manor, collected a number of her books including this previously mentioned book and a copy of her published catalogue of books from 1764, which lists her entire collection. Madame de Pompadour created 52 engraved prints of drawings by Boucher, after gemstone engravings by Gay. Her collection of work, in book form, is titled Sweet d'Estamps Graves par Madame la Marquise de Pompadour d'Apres Les Pierres Graves de Gay, Graver du Roy which in English is series of prints engraved by Madame la Marquise de Pompadour after the engraved stones of Gay, engraver of the king. The personal portfolio of Madame de Pompadour was found in the Walters Art Museum Manuscript Room by art historian Susan Wager. Some art historians argue whether or not she should be considered a collaborator with the artists under her patronage, since there is no documentation of how much Pompadour might have contributed to the works, whose idea, and whose composition, will remain a mystery. Louis XV remained devoted to Pompadour until her death from tuberculosis in 1764 at the age of 42. Louis nursed her through her illness. Even her enemies admired her courage during the final painful weeks. Voltaire wrote, I am very sad at the death of Madame de Pompadour. I was indebted to her and I mourn her out of gratitude. It seems absurd that while an ancient pen pusher, hardly able to walk, should still be alive, a beautiful woman, in the midst of a splendid career, should die at the age of 42. Many of her enemies were, however, greatly relieved. Looking at the rain during the departure of his mistress's coffin from Versailles, the devastated king reportedly said, La Marquise Honora Pas de Beau Temps, poor son voyage, the Marquise will not have good weather for her journey. She was buried at the Couvent de Capucines in Paris.